The Short Lives of Dominican Saints Part 2 January 10th Blessed Consolvo of Amarantha Confessor A.D. 1187-1259 Gonsalvo, or Gundasalvos, was a native of Portugal and was born of noble parents about 1187. When he was carried to the font, the bystanders observed that the infant fixed his eyes on the crucifix with a look of extraordinary love. Whenever, in after life, the child was fretful or ill, if his mother showed him some holy image, it immediately soothed him and he would hold out his arms to embrace it. When he grew up, he entered the ecclesiastical state and was given a rich benefice by the Archbishop of Braga. After discharging the duties attached to this post with the utmost fidelity for some years, Gonsalvo felt a great desire to visit the Holy Land as a pilgrim, and obtained leave to commit the care of his parish during his absence to one of his nephews. He spent fourteen years in pilgrimage, at the end of which time he returned to Portugal and hastened to his home. To his sorrow he found that his nephew had fallen into evil ways and was leading a life of riot and dissipation. The young man had believed that his uncle was dead, and, not recognizing him in his ragged and wayworn pilgrim, who came to his gate begging for alms, he drove him away with curses and blows. Gonsalvo did not make himself known, but, retiring to a solitary place, built a little hermitage, where he led an austere life, employing himself in preaching missions in the surrounding villages. The fame of his sanctity soon spread. Gonsalvo, however, felt that his true vocation had not yet been made manifest to him, one night, as he slept at the foot of the altar in his little hermitage, the Blessed Virgin appeared to him and commanded him to enter that religious order wherein her office began and ended with the Ave Maria. On awakening, Gonsalvo could remember no order where this custom prevailed, but he resolved at once to set out in search of the institute to which the voice of Our Lady had called him. He passed through a great part of Spain and Portugal, visiting convent after convent, before he could find the one which he sought. Arriving at length at the newly founded Dominican convent of Guimars, of which Blessed Peter Gonzales was then prior, he asked for a night's hospitality and, as he was retiring to rest, he heard the brethren, according to their custom, reciting the office of Our Lady in the dormitory. It began with the Ave Maria, and Gonsalvo listened anxiously for the conclusion, in the hope that he should receive an assurance that his search had ended and his faith and obedience were about to be rewarded. His ear soon caught the welcome sound of the angelic salutation, repeated at the close also of the office, and at once begged for the habit and was admitted into the order. After his profession, he was allowed to return with a companion to his old hermitage in Amarantha, whence he went forth, as before, to preach in the surrounding towns and villages. He built a bridge, partly with his own hands, over the river Tamaga, which flowed near his hermitage. 
Many persons had lost their lives in attempting to ford this river. Consalvo, th therefore, undertook the difficult task of constructing the bridge purely as a work of charity. God marked his approval of his servants' labors by many miracles. On one occasion, provisions failing him and the peasants who worked with him, Consalvo went to the riverside and made the sign of the cross after which he called the fishes to him, and a great number obeyed his voice. Coming to the shore and leaping about as if to show their good will, they suffered him to take them alive with his hands, and when he had secured as many as he required, he dismissed the others with his blessing. On another occasion, when he was preaching to the people, desiring to make them understand the effect of the church's censures upon the soul, he excommunicated a basket of bread, and the loaves at once became black and corrupt. Then, to show that the church can restore her to communion, those who humbly acknowledge their fault, he removed the excommunication, and the loaves recovered their whiteness and their wholesome savor. Consalvo died in 1259. Many miracles were worked through his intercession. In the year 1400, during a terrible inundation of the Tamaga, he was seen as turning aside some oak trees which, borne along by the raging stream, threatened the destruction of his bridge. In the year 1540, his chapel and hermitage came into the possession of the order. Pope Pius IV gave permission for the Mass in the office of the Blessed Consalvo to be celebrated in all the territories dependent on the crown of Portugal, a privilege which was afterwards extended by Clement X to the entire Dominican order. Prayer. O God, Thou didst wonderfully enkindle in the mind of the blessed confessor Consalvo the love of Thy holy name. Grant, we beseech Thee, that, following closely in his footsteps, we may ever think of Thee, three, and may with ardent desire do the things which are pleasing to Thee, who livest and reignest, world without end. Amen. January 16th Blessed Stefania Quizane, Virgin, A.D. 1457 to 1530. Stefania Quizane was born A.D. 1457, at a little village in the neighborhood of Brescia in Italy. Her parents were of the middle class in life, and were both of them fervent in the practice of their religious duties. From her earliest childhood, Stefana continu continually heard an interior voice repeating to her the words, Charity, Charity, charity. When only five years old, she consecrated herself to God with her whole heart, and at the age of seven she made three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, adding a promise to assume later on the habit of the Third Order of St. Dominic, to which her father belonged. Our Lord then appeared to her, accompanied by his blessed mother, St. Dominic, St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. Catherine of Siena, and espoused her to himself, bestowing on her a magnificent ring, which was seen by many persons. About this time the Quinsani family removed to Sonsino, and Stenfana placed herself under the spiritual direction of Blessed Matthew Carreri, 
of the Order of St. Dominic, who one day told her that at his death he would make her his heiress. The child did not then understand the meaning of these words, but, when the servant of God departed this life, she felt her heart painfully and mysteriously wounded, and at the same time blessed Matthew appeared to her and explained that this was the inheritance he had promised to her. When about twelve years old, she went to hear a sermon on the feast of St. Andrew. That great apostle appeared to her in a vision, holding in his hands a large cross, and addressed her in the following words, Behold, my daughter, the way to heaven. Love God, fear God, honor God, flee from the world and embrace the cross. The love of the cross became thenceforth her characteristic virtue, so that it was said of her that there were but two things for which she bore an affection, namely, Holy Communion and the sufferings. In all her visions the cross bore a remarkable part, and she gave herself up, not only to the practice of the severest austerities, but an almost uninterrupted meditation on the passion of her divine spouse. She was even permitted in some degree to undergo his sufferings in her own person, participating on Fridays in a mysterious manner in our Lord's agony and sweat of blood, his scourging at the pillar, his crowning of thorns, and his crucifixion. Her confessor, who wrote her life, testified to having seen the sacred stigmata on her hands and feet, and the marks of the crown of thorns upon her head. In one of her raptures she was given to understand that all the angels and saints together, including even our Blessed Lady herself, are unable to love God as much as He deserves to be loved. Then an abyss of love opened before her eyes, and she cried out, O oh my Lord and Redeemer, grant me the grace to love all this love, otherwise I care not to live. But our Lord smiled upon her, and told her that her wish was an impossible one, as her, inf as her finite will could not embrace that abyss of infinite love. Nevertheless, to comfort her, he said that he would accept her good will, as though she really loved to the extent to which she desired, adding, Think not that this great abyss of love remains unloved. For if creatures cannot love it, it is loved by me, who am infinite good. When, for the love of God, blessed Stefania had made an entire renunciation of her own will in the hands of her confessor, our Lord appeared to her and said, My daughter, since for the love of me thou hast generally stripped thyself of thine own will, Ask what thou wilt, and I will grant it to thee. The Holy Virgin replied almost in the words used by St. Thomas Aquinas under similar circumstances, I desire nothing but thyself, O Lord. At the age of fifteen, Stefania received the habit of the Third Order of St. Dominic, from which time she devoted herself to the care of the sick and poor in the hospitals, and to every kind of act of charity. Our Lord was pleased to work many miracles by her hands, multiplying food and money and restoring the sick to health. Her reputation for sanctity extended far and wide. The Republic of Venice and the Duke of Mantua pressed her to come and found convents in their territories. But she refused in the hope of being able to establish one in Sonsino. This she was at length able to accomplish, placing it under the invocation of St. Paul the Apostle, and peopling it with a fervent community of thirty, whom she had carefully trained to the practices of the religious life. In consequence of the war between France and Venice, 
the nuns were obliged after a time to withdraw from their convent and take shelter within the walls of the town. It was during this interval that Blessed Stefania passed to her reward on the 2nd of January, 1530, at the age of 73. She was laid to rest in the church attached to her convent, to which her community was afterwards able to return. It is, however, now suppressed, but Blessed Stefania was still held in great veneration by the people of Sonsino. She was beatified by Pope Benedict the Fourteenth in the year 1740. Prayer O God, who didst enkindle Blessed Stefania, thy virgin, with the love of the crucified, and didst in a wonderful manner render her a sharer in his passion, grant, we beseech thee, that by her intercession and example we may deserve to be made conformable to the image of thy Son. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. January 19th Blessed Andrew of Peshiria, Confessor, died 1485. Andrew Grigo was born at the beginning of the 15th century at Peshiera, a small town in the Diocese of Verona on the shores of Lake Garda in the north of Italy. Even in childhood, he was remarkable for his prayer and abstinence, and he always fasted during the whole of Lent on bread and water. He was equally admirable for his charity to the poor and his perfect obedience to his father. Finding it impossible to carry out his ardent wish to retire to some hermitage, he lived a mortified and religious life at home. His brothers, however, conceived a strange hatred for him, and as soon as their father was dead, they began to persecute and ill-treat him. He bore all their injuries with unalterable patience until the day he resolved to enter the cloister. On this occasion they accompanied him to the gates of the town, and Andrew, before taking leave of them, knelt down and humbly kissed their feet. The only property he had taken with him out of his father's house was a stick, which he now returned to his brothers, declaring them heirs to everything over which he had any claim, and begging them to keep the stick in memory of him, and never to give it away. It was laid aside in a corner of the house, where, on occasion of his holy death some years afterwards, it miraculously flowered, and many prodigies were worked by its instrumentality. Blessed Andrew received the Dominican habit in the convent of Brescia, and was thence sent to St. Mark's at Florence. Trained in the exercises of the religious life by Blessed Anthony della Chiesa, he soon became distinguished for perfection in every virtue. His life was one of incessant apostolic labor amongst the Alpine regions of northern Italy. These districts were at that time infested by heretics, who had revived the error of the Manichees, and Blessed Andrew, by his zeal and by the great number of souls whom he converted, gained for himself the title of the Apostle of the Valtelline that is, the valley watered by the river Adda. On one occasion, when he was disputing with the heretics, they produced a large volume full of blasphemous errors against the Catholic devotion to the saints. Blessed Andrew bade them open the book and see what it contained. They did so, and there issued forth an enormous viper, as though to bear witness to the venomous poison which is found in those heretical pages. 
He had a most tender devotion to the passion of our Lord, and in all the ancient pictures of him he is represented with a crucifix. In the chapel dedicated to him at Peschiera, he is depicted standing near a crucifix, whence there issues a ray of light which pierces his heart. This is believed to refer to some miraculous favor received by blessed Andrew whilst contemplating the sufferings of our Lord. On Fridays he was always accustomed to wear a crown of sharp thorns, which he dexterously concealed under his hood. Besides founding many orphanages and refuges for the destitute, Blessed Andrew caused several churches and monasteries to be erected, and the number of parishes to be increased in the wild regions which were the scene of his labors. In particular, he procured the foundation of the celebrated convent of Morbegno to serve as a rampart against heresy and vice. And thither he was wont to retire from time to time in the intervals of his apostolate to refresh his spirit by the exercises of prayer and contemplation. Such was his humility that he could accept of no post of dignity among his brethren, exercising only the humble office of going out begging for the support of the community. In his apostolic work for souls, which he carried on to an extreme old age, he fearlessly braved the dangers of glaciers, avalanches, and precipices. Nothing ever daunted his courage. His penance was rugged and severe. His love of poverty was a passion. He labored among the poor. His food was the common fare of the needy, chestnuts, barley bread, and water. He was called the father of the poor. Blessed Andrew closed his saintly life by a holy death in the midst of his brethren at Morbegno in the year 1485. His remains have twice been solemnly translated. He was beatified by Pius VIII in 1820. January 23rd. St. Raymond of Peñafort, Confessor, 1175-1275. This great saint was born in Spain, at the castle of Peñafort, six leagues distant from Barcelona, in 1175. He belonged to a noble family, allied to the former counts of Barcelona and to the kings of Aragon. Entering the ecclesiastical state, he left his native land to go and study at the celebrated University of Bologna. Having taken his doctor's degree in civil and canon law, he began to teach with great applause in that city. After some time, the Bishop of Barcelona persuaded him to return to Spain, and made him one of the canons of his cathedral. But Raymond thirsted after a closer union with God, and on Good Friday, 1222, at the age of forty-seven, he begged to be admitted to the order of St. Dominic. It is said that he was moved to take this step partly by remorse, for having once dissuaded a young man who consulted him from joining a religious order. From this time he increased in holiness of life and was the means of leading very many to leave the world and take the Dominican habit. He became confessor to King James of Aragon and was greatly distinguished for his skill in settling cases of conscience. At the command of his superiors he drew up a book on the subject, which was the first ever written of the kind. It bears his name, Raimundina. 
The Moors were at this time exercising great cruelties upon their Christian captives in Spain. On the night of the 1st of August, 1223, as Raymond was praying for these unhappy prisoners, Our Lady appeared to him and told him that it was her will that a religious order should be founded for their relief. On the same night, the Queen of Heaven made a similar re revelation to the King James of Aragon and to St. Peter Nolasco, a penitent of St. Raymond's, who for some years had devoted himself to the work of charity, and who was destined to be the founder of the new order of Our Lady of Mercy for the redemption of captives. Its statutes were drawn up by St. Raymond, who with his own hands gave the habit to St. Peter Nolasco. It resembled exactly that of the order to which he himself belonged, save that the mantle was white and the scapular emblazoned with the royal arms of Aragon. St. Raymond was now summoned to Rome by Gregory the Ninth, where he became confessor to the Holy Father and Grand Penitentiary. In obedience to the Pope's command, he collected all the decretals, that is, the degree, decrees and replies of the sovereign pontiffs to questions which had been submitted to the Holy See, and he added explanations to those the meaning of which seemed obscure. He accomplished this gigantic task in the short space of three years. The Pope twice named him to an archbishopric, but the saint each time succeeded in obtaining his release from an honor which would have been painful to his humility. After the lamented death of Blessed Jordan, the first successor of St. Dominic, St. Raymond was elected Master General of the Order by the Chapter of Bologna, A.D. 1238. During the two years of his government, the saint made some admirable regulations, and divided the constitutions into two parts, the first relating to the religious life of the brethren, and the second to their external life, their duties and offices. At the general chapter of 1240, he prevailed upon the electors to accept his resignation on the plea of ill health and infirmity. But so great was the grief of the entire order at losing their saintly superior that a subsequent general chapter inflicted severe penances and absolution from office on all those who had accepted this resignation. The saint lived thirty-five years after he had given up office, leading a most saintly existence in his convent in Barcelona. Almost every night his guardian angel awoke him before matins and summoned him to prayer. He labored incessantly to procure the conversion of the Moors, as well as of Jews and heretics, and it was at his request that St. Thomas Aquinas composed his Summa Contra Gentiles. He accompanied King James of Aragon in his expedition to the island of Majorca, and boldly rebuked him for giving public scandal. Finding his remonstrances of no effect, the saint prepared to return to his convent in Barcelona. The king endeavored to retain him on the island by force, but St. Raymond, in presence of a multitude of spectators, threw his mantle on the sea, fastened the end of it to his staff, which served as a mast, and kneeling upon it as if in a boat, he crossed in this way to the mainland, accomplishing the passage, a distance of about a hundred miles, in six hours. On reaching Barcelona, he quietly took up his mantle, which was perfectly dry, and returned to his convent. The doors were closed, as it was the hour of the midday siesta, but the saint found himself miraculously transported within the walls, and thus escaped from the acclamations of the admiring crowd who had witnessed his landing. 
The king was so touched by the miracle that he renounced his evil courses and thenceforth led a good life. St. Raymond was universally regarded as the greatest ecclesiastic of his time. At length, worn out by age, infirmity, and penances, he happily departed to our Lord on the Feast of the Epiphany, 1275, being in his hundredth year. Numerous prodigies were worked at his tomb, whence issued a miraculous dust which restored health to many persons. He was beatified by Pope Paul V, and canonized by Pope Clement VIII in 1601. January 24th Blessed Marcolino of Forli, Confessor, 1317-1397 Blessed Marcolino Amani was born at the little town of Forli in Italy in 1317. He was not gifted with great talents, but from his earliest years was remarkable for his holiness of life. At the age of ten, he abandoned the world and consecrated himself to God in the Dominican order. He was so great a lover of solitude that he never left his cell or the convent without necessity. He led a most penitential life, and one of the most of almost uninterrupted prayer. He spoke but little and was always attentive to the wants of his brethren, and ready to render them any service in his power. Humility and simplicity were his characteristic virtues, and he strove to conceal the supernatural favors granted to him by God. His devotion in celebrating Mass was very great. He often went into an ecstasy while offering the holy sacrifice. Some, who treated this holy and simple man with contempt, used to say that he went to sleep at those times. Hence he was closely watched and the supernatural character of these ecstasies was clearly manifested. He always sought to take the lowest place, and unless prevented, would not take his meals in the refractory, but in the kitchen with the servants. He ever loved the company of children, and was a favorite with them from his gentle and winning ways. He bore a tender devotion to our Blessed Lady, and a statue of her, which he had in his cell, is cell said to have spoken to him several times. In consequence of his fervor and the exact observance of the rule, he was employed by Blessed Raymond of Capua in the reform of the order after the ravages of the Black Death, and he succeeded in re-establishing regular discipline in several convents. He died at the age of eighty, in 1397. Scarcely had he breathed his last, when an unknown child of entrancing beauty, supposed to have been an angel, was seen hur hurrying through the streets, exclaiming, Hasten to the convent of the friar's preachers. The blessed father Marcolino just died. The people, obeying the summons, flocked to the convent, and their faith and devotion were rewarded by many miracles. Blessed Marcolino was beatified by Benedict the Fourteenth in 1750. Blessed Margaret of Hungary 1242 to 1270. In the year 1242, Hungary was governed by a devout king, Bela the Fourth. His territories were overrun by hordes of Tartars, whose sacrileges and cruelties filled the entire kingdom with scenes of bloodshed and violence. In their distress, Bela and his queen, 
vowed to dedicate their first daughter to the service of God if he would grant them victory over their enemies. Then, full of trust in the divine goodness, Bella led his little army against the Tartars, who were utterly defeated and driven from the country. Margaret's birth occurred shortly afterwards, and in consequence of her parents' vow, she was taken to the Dominican convent, convent of Vesperin when only three years old. Even at that tender age she showed extraordinary signs of devotion. In less than six months she knew the office of Our Lady by heart, merely from hearing the sisters recite it. She was clothed in the religious habit on her fourth birthday, on which occasion she was shown a crucifix, and she asked for some explanation of the sacred symbol. On hearing that it represented Jesus Christ, who shed his blood for us even to the last drop, she immediately covered it with kisses, exclaiming, Lord, I give and abandon myself to thee forever. Her parents built a magnificent monastery for her in an island of the Danube, about a mile from Buda, and hither she removed with several other sisters when she attained the age of ten. When she was twelve years old, she made her solemn profession into the hands of Blessed Humbert, the general of the order. Her parents afterwards obtained a papal dispensation in order to marry her to the king of Bohemia, but this only gave Margaret an opportunity for showing that her religious life was the result of her own free choice, for no prayers or entreaties would induce her to quit the cloister. In order to protect herself from further annoyances of this kind, she was solemnly veiled and consecrated to God, according to the rite given in the Roman Pontifical, in the presence of the Archbishop of Strigononia and a number of other prelates. The ceremony took place at the altar of her aunt, St. Elizabeth of Hungary. Blessed Margaret looked upon herself as the vilest person in the convent and rendered the most menial servants, not only to her sisters but even to the servants. It was her delight to wash the dishes, sweep the house, and discharge the lowliest domestic duties. She had a tender love for the poor, and wept when she had no alms to bestow on them. But it was, above all, upon her sick sisters that she poured forth the treasures of her charity, claiming it as her right to render them all the most loathsome and repulsive services which their condition might require. Her life was one of continual prayer and hard labor, and she practiced the most austere penance. Her tender love for her divine spouse made her hunger after a share in his sufferings and humiliations, and she often compelled her companions to scourge her with pitiless severity. Her habit was worn out at the knees and elbows by her continual genuflections and prostrations. She thirsted for martyrdom, and, on hearing a rumor that the Tartars were about to invade Hungary, she exclaimed, I pray God that my father's kingdom may be spared so terrible a scourge. Nevertheless, if they are to come, I trust they will come here, that we may receive our crown at their hands. Her love for our blessed lady was so great that, at the mere sound of the name Mary, she would fall upon her knees and bow her head to the dust, to do honor to her whom she delighted in saluting, the mother of God and my hope. Blessed Margaret died at the early age of twenty-eight. Almost innumerable miracles have been worked through her intercession. Petitions were repeatedly presented to the Holy See for her beatification, and Pius VII extended to the order of St. Dominic the permission to celebrate her festival which was already kept in many churches.
January 28th Translation of the Relics of St. Thomas Aquinas, Confessor and Doctor of the Church The great luminary of the Church, St. Thomas Aquinas, departed this life at the Benedictine Abbey of Fossa Nuova, when he uh, was on his way to the General Council of Lyons, and his sacred remains were interred there until such a time as the Master General of the Dominicans should determine to be what convent they were to be removed. The Benedictines were resolved not to part with the treasure. Hence they secretly removed the body by night from the cloister where it had been buried, and laid it in the chapel of St. Stephen. But the holy doctor would not suffer that those who came from all parts to implore his intercession should offer their supplications at an empty tomb. He therefore appeared to the abbot, reproved him super severely for what he had done, and threatened him with chastisement if his remains were not restored to their first resting place. The abbot obeyed, and, taking a few of the monks into his confidence, proceeded with the utmost secrecy to a fresh translation of the body. But the moment the tomb was opened, there issued forth a most sweet odor, which spread itself throughout the convent, and brought the entire community to the church to a certain whence it came. The body was found to be in a state of perfect preservation, both on this occasion and at another translation seven, seven years later, when it was laid in a marble tomb by the side of the high altar. Fourteen years after the saint, the monks gave his right hand to his sister, the Countess of Severino, and this precious relic became, later on, the property of the Dominican convent of Salerno, where it is still preserved incorrupt. The monks then presented the head of St. Thomas to the Count of Piperno, and in the year 1349, hearing that a celebrated bandit had formed the sacrilegious project of stealing and selling the body of the saint, they entrusted the remainder of the sacred relics to the keeping of the Count of Fondi. After some time St. Thomas appeared to this nobleman, and threatened him with the vengeance of God if he did not give up his body to the brethren of his own order. This was accordingly done. But the monks of Fossa Nuova were by no means prepared to relinquish their claim to the possession of the sacred relics. They carried their complaints before Pope Urban, Urban V, himself a menor, member of the Benedictine order. His Holiness testified extreme displeasure at what had been done, and commanded the Master General of the Dominican Order to restore the body of St. Thomas to the monks of Fossa Nuova. In vain did the Master General represent the earnest desire of the Dominican Order to possess the relics of the greatest of its sons. Urban was inexorable. A few days later, on the festival of Corpus Christi, the general ventured to renew his entreaties, reminding his holiness that the church was indebted to St. Thomas for the beautiful office recited on that feast. He begged that his relics might rest among his own brethren, who would show them more honor than any one else. The pope hesitated for a few moments. Then, in the most solemn manner, he gave judgment in the following terms. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the holy apostles Peter and Paul, and ours, we give and grant that the body of the blessed Thomas Aquinas, professed religious of the order of preachers, to you, the Master General, and to the said order, to be kept either at Toulouse or at Paris, as seems good to the next general chapter and to the Master General of the Order, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. 
And all the bystanders answered, Amen. On the following day, however, the Pope decided to question in favor of Toulouse, where he had himself founded a university. In virtue of this permission, the holy body was brought from Fondi, and the head from Piperno, and thence both were conveyed with utmost caution to France. The journey from Gaeta to Proil, where the holy body was first deposited, occupied two months, and many miracles took place on the way. It was evident, said an old chronicler, that St. Thomas went where it pleased him. After remaining for a month at Proil, the precious remains were brought to the convent of the Order of St. Dominic at Toulouse on January 28th, 1369, more than fifty thousand persons coming out to meet them, bearing lighted tapers, while ten thousand carried large torches around the bier. The canopy over the relics was borne by the Duke of Anjou, brother to the King of France, and by other persons of the highest rank. In that same year an arm of the holy doctor detached from the body, and deposited with great solemnity in the Dominican Church of St. James in Paris, where the saint had taught with so much applause. And a few years later, another considerable relic was given to his beloved convent of St. Dominic at Naples. Thus the remains of the angelic doctor at length reposed in peace, according to his desire, in the midst of his brethren, until the evil days of the French Revolution, when the Dominicans were driven from their convent of Toulouse, the sacred remains were then transferred for greater safety to the crypt of the church of St. Cernin, where sacrilegious hands were soon laid on the costly reliquaries wherein they were contained. During the present century the relics of the holy doctor had undergone several translations into more suitable reliquaries, and to more honorable places in the same church. At the translation in the year 1852, the sermon was preached by Perry Henri Dominique Le Cordaire, restorer of the Dominican order in France, and in the last, which took place in the year 1878, the Bishop of Toulouse was assisted by the Vicar General of the Order, the Most Reverend Father San Vito. This day is regarded as a special festival of the confraternity of the angelic warfare, or girdle, of St. Thomas Aquinas. February 9th Blessed Bernard Scamacca, Confessor, died in 1486. Bernard Scamacca was born of a noble family of Catania in Sicily. His youth was spent in sinful disorders, but a wound which he received in one of his legs proved the means of his conversion. During his long hours of suffering and sleeplessness, he entered into himself, real, realized the perilous condition of his soul, and resolved to renounce his evil ways. On his recovery, he asked and received the Dominican habit in the convent of Catania, and henceforth devoted himself to a life of prayer and penance. He was distinguished for his obedience and humility, and for his gift of contemplation. When he retired into the garden to pray, as he was fond of doing, the little birds would come and perch on his head, and outstretched arms, and there sing sweetly, filling him with the thought of the celestial harmonies, nor would they depart until they received his blessing. He was favored with the gift of prophecy, and many prodigies showed how dear to God was this humble and penitent soul. 
Once he was found raised in the air in ecstasy before a crucifix. On another occasion the porter knocked loudly at the door of his cell to summon him to some ministry of charity. Receiving no answer, he was about to repeat the summons, when he saw a brilliant light issuing through a chink in the door, and, looking through the keyhole, he beheld the holy man in rapture, and by his side a child of heavenly beauty, bearing a lighted torch, which filled the cell with brilliant light. Blessed Bernard devoted himself with generous ardor to the relief of the bodily and spiritual needs of his neighbors. While preaching to others, he failed not to expiate the sins of his youth by the practice of several austerities. He died in 1486. Fifteen years later, he appeared to the prior of the convent, and bade him remove his remains to a more honorable resting place. This was accordingly done, and the body was found in incorrupt. During the whole of the ceremony the church bells, untouched by mortal hands, rang out with heavenly melody. Miracles of all kinds were worked at Blessed Bernard's tomb. A nobleman who had been cured through his intercession resolved to remove the sacred remains to his castle, and came by night to the convent with a troop of armed men to carry out his design. But the servant of God would not allow his body to be removed from the convent where he had lived and died. Appearing in the dormitory, he knocked at every door, telling the friars that violent hands were being laid on his body in the church, and as they delayed obeying his summons, which they thought to be only a dream, he began to ring the great bell. Then the brethren hurried to the church, where they found the tomb empty and the sacred body lying at the door, surrounded by armed men who were vainly endeavoring to raise it from the ground. It had miraculously become so heavy that the robbers were unable to move it. They took to flight at the approach of the friars, who had not the slightest difficulty in restoring the precious remains to their resting place. Blessed Bernard, having always received great veneration in Sicily, was finally beatified by Leo the Twelfth in 1825.